I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would assume that most of your staff, especially the people at the top, could earn a lot more outside Sarvode than they could at Sarvode. How do you sell a vision so compellingly to just get people to buy into it? We're talking essentially about the biggest humanitarian development organization in the country. How big is this? As the organization grows, how do you personally, right at the top, how do you keep your heart soft? Dr. Vinya Aryaratna, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, if it's okay with you, I want to start right at the beginning. Uh, you took over Sarvode from your father, uh, and that probably is already quite complicated, taking over from a family member. But on top of that, he is an iconic leader, someone who's very popular and, and a founder leader. And taking over an organization from a founder leader is quite complicated because I'm sure the, the expectations on you would have been quite high. Uh, did you feel any of those pressures and how did you deal with those challenges? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dishan, uh, for inviting me for this conversation. Uh, actually, um, let me explain it uh, this way. Uh, it wasn't really like uh, he stepped down and I took over. So there wasn't like that kind of uh, uh, transition. So it, it was, there was an overlap and kind of transition. And also I wouldn't say that I took over from him, even now. Uh, I think it's a different uh, uh, leadership uh, setup that I have uh, now uh, moved into. Uh, it's more kind of a collective leadership. Of course, I, I give the leadership as a president of the organization. And also the... Uh, uh, transition it took uh, two decades I think sure. <laughs> because I, I took over a position uh, in 2000 that was after 10 years of uh, practicing uh, medicine and being an academic in a medical school and then uh, I started as the executive director of Sarvodaya for 10 years and uh, still under my father's leadership because he was the president until uh, 2018 when Sarvodaya celebrated 60 years then only I took over as the president but again uh, from 2010 to 2018 I occupied a governance position because I really wanted to groom the next layer of leadership in Sarvodaya so I handed over the executive directorship to a younger person who continues as the executive director uh, to uh, this date and um, so it wasn't uh, kind of a clear cut okay uh, the leadership uh, is taken taken over from this date and uh, so I, I think still he is the visionary leader of the movement and uh, I am uh, also uh, being the president of the organization responsible for the strategic directions to the, the functioning of the organization but we have multiple layers of uh, leadership in the organization. So just to give me a sense of how big this is, uh, we're talking essentially about the biggest humanitarian development organization in the country, uh, probably the biggest civil society organization in the country. How big is this? How many volunteers? How many staff? How many people are you serving? How big is this? So in terms of the, if I start with the outreach uh, to the community, over a period of 63 years, we have been able to reach about 15,000 out of about 38,000 villages. So that means some form of activity would have taken place in those 15,000 villages. So uh, the, the activities would have been just a Stramadana camp to rehabilitate a village tank or cut a road, uh, construct a road or have a culvert or bridge built in the, uh, the village, that kind of activities too. Much more sophisticated uh, community-based organizations uh, centered activities uh, to in about 5,400 out of these 15,000 villages. Now, when I say 5,400 odd villages, those are villages where we have been able to form a community-based organization. It's a legal entity registered under the society's ordinance of the law of the land. So, uh, that means they have gone through the kind of a structured mm -hmm. mobilization process and been able to um, uh, uh, been able to <clears throat> really develop their own uh, 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 program of work to satisfy the basic needs in the village. So we have uh, uh, an outreach to about 5,400 and if you take uh, say uh, 100 to sometimes 400, 500 families in a village, it's quite a large outreach, maybe about uh, a million and a million and a half outreach in terms of touching the lives of the people. Then in the uh, when you look at the the physical infrastructure we have a physical infrastructure which is uh, reaching all 
nooks and corners of the country in all 25 administrative districts. So we have 25 district centers around the country. In addition, uh, in the kind of work that we need, uh, we do, we need leaders and leadership training is required. Then training in various specialized uh, fields from child development to nutrition, health, or enterprise development, uh, environmental conservation. So we have 10 development education institutes around the country which have residential facilities. So this is the uh, structure starting from the village level societies, district level uh, infrastructure to, to support these village level work and the national level we have the Sarvode headquarters. So altogether we have actually uh, not a very big staff when you compare to the scale of operations. We have about 350 full time staff in the main organization. So the main organization is the Lanka Jatika Sarvodesh Ramadana Sangame, which is incorporated by an act of parliament. Then we have other national organizations specializing in different subjects. We have our own economic empowerment arm, which is called the Sarvodesh Development Finance, which is a central bank regulated entity, which is the only finance institution in the country, which is owned by a charitable organization. The majority shares are with the main uh, charitable organization plus the village level societies and affiliated organizations. When you put together these other what we call national level independent organizations numbering about 12, we have about 1200 full time staff. Then we still uh, function as a voluntary organization. We are a voluntary movement. So we mobilize volunteers from village level. We have th we support thousands of preschools. All these preschool teachers, majority of them are either volunteers or looked after by these uh, community-based organizations which have their own small enterprises which generate an income and support to run the preschool. So it's a very unique sustainable model and uh, put, put all these uh, organizations together we probably have more than 100,000 volunteers at any given time. So that's in essence the scale of operation. I think we are reaching about probably 15 to 20 percent of the population of Sri Lanka. Wow, it's, it's mind-boggling to think about the numbers, to think about how many people uh, you are serving. And, and my, my, my question is, uh, it's a personal question in that uh, when you started in the 1950s, like you said, it was very simple. There was no full-time staff. You went from village to village. Uh, you were essentially there with the people. Uh, but as the organization grows, now you've got hundreds of staff, hundreds of thousands of volunteers, uh, essentially serving millions of people. How do you, you personally, how do you keep your heart, for want of a better phrase, how do you keep your heart soft? How do you keep sensitive to what people you are serving are going through? As it scales, as, as, the, as the work scales and you get further and further away from the people that you might be serving, how do you personally, right at the top, how do you keep your heart soft? Excellent question. I think, you know, when my father was uh, uh, still like uh, in the initial stages when he was... Uh, developing or uh, developing the movement um, he visited each and every village at that time I was also uh, I was very young I, I was born in 1962 but from 1965 six onwards I still remember going to villages living in villages and uh, and I, I also grew up with that social consciousness I never sort of felt that you know we, we needed uh, much better life ourselves personally we, we really saw the the reality of villages. So that connection was very important. And I think that foundation was laid at a very early stage of my life. So the, there was a, there was a uh, kind of a check built in. Uh, the moment you get disconnected or distanced, I would feel it myself first. If, if that doesn't happen, then I should not be in that position. Uh, because then, then uh, this, this work doesn't make sense. Uh, so uh, there are two ways in which I keep connected to the to the uh, reality. One is that no matter uh, how busy I am, I do visit uh, the field very often myself. Uh, villages, our district centers. Sometimes we, we may not have the time to visit a large number of villages, but I uh, go to the district center, and then there are also uh, representatives from the village uh, societies coming, and uh, so that dialogue is there. So there's a reality check. And also, as you say, when you grow up, when, you, when the movement grows up very, very, uh, as a big organization, there is also other ways of feedback, yeah. <laughs> which is coming, you know, in Sri Lanka, you know what I mean, it can be in the form of, uh, you know, 
Fred tests or petitions or now with social media. So, so you can't escape. You can't yeah. pretend that something is not right or something is going well. Or so, so I think there's a reality check always. But uh, the second point is, I think it's very important. The question you asked: How do you get the people who are running? It's not just myself, but you know, uh, when the organization gets bigger and also specialized, and then we are also transforming the organization to comply with new regulatory uh, you know uh, requirements uh, there are also financial regulation in, uh, uh, requirements now we have to comply sometimes even beyond like a normal private sector entity humanitarian organizations have to be accountable not just financially legally but also morally to the community and then there are additional uh, re uh, reporting requirements imposed by donors because they want us to stick to uh, those uh, conditions so then there can be the danger of you shifting into a bureaucracy and it had happened i must admit in certain instances we have shifted and got disconnected in certain uh, areas but it's kind of a pendulum so the moment you feel that um, this is now shifting more towards uh, uh, complying with all these requirements and not really being responsive to the needs of people then that is when the leadership has to really take corrective actions so i think that safeguards are now built into the organization institutionalized so even from the recruitment of people now we have to recruit specialized people we have phds in our organization mds in our organization but the thing is uh, it's not just their technical skills or qualifications, but they need to also be connected to the vision. And uh, we, we have different ways of uh, uh, checking whether, you know, they, they, they subscribe to that philosophy. And we have elders who always keep an eye. They are like the vision keepers. I say like wicket keepers, they are vision keepers. So vision keepers are there who will always alert and kind of a, I would say early warning system is in place, informal early warning system if we are deviating and even myself sometimes is being kept under check. If I don't go out to the field for two or three weeks, then I get I get the signals uh, which forces me to, the, to go to the field. It's such a, a wonderful thing you, you just said because I think a sense of accountability at all levels of an organization towards the mission of the organization is such a healthy way to run an organization and um, I wonder because uh, you're a volunteer based organization from the start even now so many volunteers um, we are a, a, a warm culture we are a, a communal culture and I wonder as the as the country gets more and more westernized are you seeing a, a change in the way people volunteer uh, is the is is volunteerism affected or what, what do you think or do you, does it remain unaffected no, it is affected. I mean, uh, now collectivism is not, not there to the same degree, same level that we used to see 20, 30 years ago. Uh, but you have to accept that as a reality. So there is uh, like at the beginning of the movement in the 60s and the 70s and even 80s, there were many young people, not just because they didn't have any other opportunities in life, but uh, there was there was strength of numbers. Even in a village, there were large numbers of youth who were who were there and who were looking forward to working uh, in in a uh, in a group and um, trying to fulfil some of the basic needs in the village. So that was the that was the start of the movement. So Sarvodaya really gave them an opportunity to come together and also uh, really organise themselves and then gave them the skills to plan. If you if you uh, you how to know about your own village probably you live in the village but you probably don't know the full reality of the village how many people uh, you know have uh, these types of uh, social problems uh, so it was a structured pro program where they could come together and uh, devote their time and they were not like even immediately after school they were not looking for a job as such right maybe there weren't opportunities also and the economic system was quite different no i mean the, the open economy that was there, uh, that came about after 1978, uh, there was the whole uh, social structure changed and with the political system also changing. So you don't get the spirit of volunteerism in the same way that you used to have um, probably in the 70s or 80s. But then I still believe that uh, the uh, spirit of volunteerism uh, to suit the present day realities, present day needs, 
uh, is still there if we know how to tap them uh, in the right correct way take for example the the, the covid 19 lockdown you could see volunteers and people you know spontaneously came out to help each other uh, those families who were in quarantine people went and you know uh, kept uh, uh, ration uh, dry ration packs uh, at their doorsteps you know so that that kind of volunteer spirit uh, is there that's why if you look at the indices international indices of charity giving we are still in the top of the list it's because of that volunteerism you know these uh, young people some sometimes i work with uh, you know these groups who uh, uh, who uh, come to our uh, headquarters and also ask that they go and engage with in a village project so uh, and some of them may not have been exposed to that kind of reality in sri lanka the vast gaps that exist in our society so the moment that they see they get a new insight about what they all do and then uh, it's not to get frustrated give up your job and start working in <laughs> for uh, in in charity uh, but how do you then uh, transform those systems to be more fair just by the people of this country right where you don't get the corporates to make huge profits at the at the expense of uh, the the uh, well being of communities destruction of environment so i see a, a, a huge uh, uh, interest amongst many many uh, communities in the country uh, to engage volunteers at the same time in the in the uh, corporate world we see the uh, interest also to get their uh, get their professionals uh, also engaged in uh, volunteer work and also uh, different uh, academic groups even we are hosting international volunteers i uh, think of the spirit of volunteerism you mentioned and um, i don't want to put words in your mouth but i would assume uh, that most of your staff especially the people at the top uh, could earn a lot more outside sarvodaya than they could at sarvodaya Uh, so essentially they're doing it out of the passion they feel in their heart uh, they believe in the vision and the philosophy of the organization they aren't motivated by money and that goes without saying for volunteers uh, they aren't driven by money how do you how do you get so many people to give you their time their effort and their passion uh, when money is not on the table how do you sell a vision so compellingly uh, to to just get people to buy into it yes nishan now um, even though you say that uh, we we are driven uh, primarily by a volunteer vision and you know that uh, sense of uh, service to the others uh, i think when you run an organization like uh, uh, sarvodaya at this scale you need people and they need to be also paid at at least at a certain level uh, of you know um, Uh, remuneration where they can satisfy their basic needs so we have also uh, tried our best because otherwise you can't retain and sometimes sometimes it's very frustrating to people they really want to want to work but there are demands on their you know from their family side and all that right so i i really don't believe that it's fair and it's sustainable if you don't build an organization to a level where you can give them at least a you can't compete with the private sector but a basic level uh, of uh, remuneration and benefits that they can uh, lead a uh, fairly uh, good uh, uh, family life so we have uh, tried our best over the years to have a uh, salary structure which 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 is fair by the workers also even though uh, we are a voluntary organization so they know very well when they join particularly those professionals whom we have to recruit uh, know very well that they can even as you say said uh, earn two to three times more in the private sector but the other incentive is that we give them other opportunities to really enhance their own careers even now the organizations because of its profile we have uh, access to top notch universities to academics to professionals who who are uh, you know, sometimes coming uh, to our uh, programs and then uh, uh, giving lectures or giving an opportunity for our uh, workers to uh, work with them like uh, interns and and they serve as mentors that's an opportunity that they'll not get even in the private sector sometimes private sector would have to pay uh, to get these uh, you know executives trained by that kind of people so there are top professionals in the country and the world who are willing and say 
I'll come and you know groom your staff on this. Now we have uh, I'll give you one concrete example. We have a program called Sarvodaya Fusion. It is the information communication technology arm of Sarvodaya, and we are working with top-notch companies like Microsoft and uh, now Google and uh, and uh, Facebook, right? And um, uh, the uh, local ICT sector professionals, top names, are in our advisory board. And they come and spend sometimes two or three days coaching and mentoring some of these uh, team members of Sarvodaya Fusion. And, and that is a huge contribution. So they will never get that opportunity if they were working in another organization. So that is one. So you, you give them opportunity to enhance their uh, knowledge, skills. Even if they don't uh, remain in Sarvodaya, it will be a career development for them. So starting with uh, having some kind of a fair remuneration system and also on top of that having the opportunities to uh, enhance their their own uh, skills and uh, and knowledge and then really the more important point is the satisfaction you get self fulfillment and they experience it and once you experience it okay this is this is uh, uh, my passion and then i could put my uh, trained mind into something which will also give me uh, not just a remuneration but also uh, self satisfaction so i think uh, this third uh, fact uh, third point is the one which holds them together initially they would have joined because uh, they they subscribe to the philosophy but then once they start experiencing it once they have start seeing the benefit that the others are getting from their uh, uh, their work out of the contribution that they make i think that will keep them going then the final point is that uh, we expect every one of us to set a kind of an example of a leading a sim simple life. Simple life doesn't mean that you rough out and you know you suffer. No, absolutely not. Even Buddha said it's the middle path. You don't self motivate yourself or you you don't indulge to the other extreme. The middle path, right? So uh, most of our executives to uh, you know I wouldn't we don't use the word executives but our senior staff to to uh, all the field level workers lead the uh, simpler life you know they they don't uh, indulge in uh, unnecessary uh, you know um, practices to uh, uh, that will cost them a lot so you know so that kind of lifestyle i think is also being encouraged and appreciated and these are values and recognized by everyone and support each other even though sometimes we don't uh, give them a big salary in the in when they need something uh, whether it's their children's education or some when, when they have a family crisis there's a built-in social support network within the organization and that is invaluable doctor you've got so many things on your plate you're balancing so many opportunities so many projects balancing different relationships how do you get it all done how do you stay productive uh, do you have any uh, habits or, or practical things that you can share with me uh, that I can learn from. How do you stay productive? Yeah, so uh, there are, I mean, when you work in a charitable organization, a service oriented organization, there are multiple demands on you. Uh, I think um, the first thing is you should uh, delegate. If you have a team, I think uh, delegation and empowering them and uh, really guiding them will make your life a lot easier. So uh, the setup that I have in Sarvode is that the uh, executive director and the operations team is given the, the freedom to decide and you know, uh, do their normal work and we develop work plans. Of course, there are certain unexpected uh, uh, you know, issues that will come up and uh, they can consult you anytime. For me, I always uh, probably it comes from my training as a doctor, you know, where you have to prioritize. Uh, you have to look at the situation, you make an analysis and okay, you know, this, this is my, it's like uh, when you are managing a ward uh, in, in a hospital, uh, you know when you walk out of the ward after finishing the day's work, okay, I have two or three bad patients, you know, so I, I should be conscious like that. I think in an organizational setup, you should know what your priorities are, where your own involvement is required. So on a daily basis, I, I know uh, for, for that particular day, uh, what would be my priority uh, and I, I manage it uh, that way. So delegation and then for your own, um, uh, in your own calendar, in your own daily uh, work uh, program, you prioritize. 
then also uh, i think you have to have uh, organizations need to have long term plans so uh, we have what we call the the five year strategic plans and then uh, every year we we try to uh, develop a, a work plan based on the strategic plan but there are situations where you have to really change everything now the covid is the best example so there are we immediately and it's not being reactive we are used to um, face natural law man made disaster so as a humanitarian organization this preparedness is very important and that's in your dna so you know that you know a certain thing happened and then you have to change your plans and then uh, respond so having a plan where you say okay this is this is my this is our organization's priority and this is my role for the next 3 months now uh, when you look at the past uh, 18 months or 20 months we could not plan anything we don't know when the next wave of covid will come but we know okay there are scenarios that you can build if it is if there's a lockdown this this is how we are going to manage the organization if there's half lockdown this is how we are going to manage but then what comes after is important so you plan and you have continuous dialogue i think this dialogue with the team is so important the co team co management team and co governance team need to have a very good understanding and also build trust trust building is so important that you uh, at the same time you give the delegate the authority to others you should also the others should have uh, trust on you that you are given the freedom to make some major decisions uh, uh, for the sake of the organization uh, in a time of uh, crisis so i think uh, this type of very simple planning Uh, will help you to uh, face those situations and and be still uh, relevant to the uh, goals of the organization and keep the organization and the team intact dr vinaya uh, thank you again so much for your time really appreciate it learned a lot and i'm uh, i'm sure many other people who watch this will be blessed as well thank you so much most welcome and thank you for inviting me